Hi everyone and thank you for the invitation to join you here today. As Violetta mentioned, I'm from the University of Calgary in Canada and today is Thanksgiving Day in Canada. So as my friends and family at home are preparing to think about cooking the turkey later today, I'm thankful to be here with all of you and for all of the preparations that you made, uh, both with us and behind the scenes. As Violetta mentioned, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a, a different topic than usual. Often I talk about plagiarism, but today I'm going to talk about an extension of the research that I do on fake degrees and academic fraud. So the provenance of this work comes from a book that I did together with my colleagues Jamie Carmichael and Helen Petrick on fake degrees and fraudulent credentials in higher education, as well as the Handbook of Academic Integrity, which is just uh, being finished up in its second edition, now available, it's available online. Hardcover will come out next year, but mainly I'll be drawing from the work that we did on fake degrees And I want to give a shout out to two of the major collaborators from that work um, on the right hand side of the screen You see uh, retired FBI special agent Alan Ezel who spent more than a decade in a special operation called dip scam Where there were more than 35 prosecutions in the United States related to degree mills diploma mills and fake degrees He's an expert in this area. He contributed to our book um, and I've often said that the work that we we do in academic integrity is transdisciplinary, meaning that we tackle wicked problems that no one scholar can tackle by themselves or even together with people from their own discipline. We need to extend our research to include professionals, higher education professionals, as well as industry, government, and in this case, law enforcement. Uh, learning from Alan Ezel was like taking a master class in fake degrees. And then to my collaborator, Jamie Carmichael, who's an associate registrar uh, in Ottawa at the Carleton University. So we began our collaboration together about three years ago and continue to learn about this field um, which I think now fake degrees and fraudulent credentials needs to be part of the conversation on academic integrity I'm hoping by the end of our time together you'll agree with me so this is a little bit of a timeline it's difficult to see but I'll give you the highlights this is a uh, timeline of academic and fraud uh, credentials in North America uh, dating back to the 1880s when fake degrees were first identified by the US Bureau of Education as diploma mills being a problem at that time. Um, and then we, the first international diploma mill was discovered 1916 again in the United States. And I'm drawing from the United States here because we don't really have much evidence from my country or globally until after that. Really this field was first identified by the Americans and we built on the research that they started doing. 1939, the first known scholarly article on contract cheating came out. It was called uh, ghostwriting at the time in a small journal, uh, but basically someone was interviewing a ghostwriter and talking about how he ran his business that at the time included six typists in a small um, apartment working out of New York City, which at the time would have been considered quite an industry. Then we move into some of the research that was started in the US with Bowers' survey starting in the 1960s. Then in Canada, we start to identify term paper mills that had come up from the eastern seaboard of the United States. They came up to Canada in the Toronto area in the 1970s. By the 1980s, Alan Ezel and his team started Operation Dip Scam that ran from 1980 to 1991. Um, and by the 1990s, we had large scale research uh, happening in the US and abroad. Uh, and really, the internet started to catalyze the fake degree industry and the commercial academic fraud industry. Fast forwarding to the 2000s, many of you will know, Thomas Lancaster and Bob Clark coined the term contract cheating, and then the research really started, catalyzed by the Australians in the 2010s. Uh, and then in the 2020s, we're starting to connect the dots. So I'll begin to connect the dots, and I think that Kane will continue that in his presentation. But there's your really quick timeline of fake degrees, uh, at least in North America. Maybe I can issue a challenge and say, what's this timeline look like in Europe? Maybe that's a project for someone here to take on. Uh, and what was the first time in Ireland that you might have identified fake degrees and fraudulent credentials here? That might be something for you to take forward as part of your work. So we now have more than 100 years of evidence, uh, mainly from newspaper reports and government documents, government reports and so forth, uh, that contract cheating and degree fraud have certainly existed in North America. I talked about connecting the dots in 2020. So, 2019, Alan Ezel uh, and his colleagues wrote an article called Academic Fraud in the World's Largest Diploma Mill. It was published in a professional journal, not a scholarly journal, called College and University. 
it's restricted. That journal is restricted to folks who are members of an association called ACRAL, and that's for um, a, a college and university registrars in the United States and Canada. I even couldn't get hold of this article because I'm not a registrar. Um, so I actually went to our university registrar and said, could I get on our institutional roster so I can, you know, be part of this for the, for the university? And I, so I could get my hands on the article and I was allowed to. But there was no way for me as a scholar to access this article any other way. And when we were starting to do our research, one thing we found by working with, for us, it was CMAC, the Canadian Ministers of Education. They said, we have reports and we'll share them with you and you can't share them. They wanted to keep the information close, close in. And by doing our book, we sort of opened the, the can of worms, if you will. But in that article in 2019, Alan Zell and his colleagues published about the blackmail that happens when a company who sells you a fake degree says, we're going to continue to charge you, um, because if not, we'll tell your employer that you've got a fake degree. And that echoed what had happened in Australia uh, in 2020 when John York and his colleagues at Curtin University published their first article on blackmail and contract cheating. The same thing happening with students and contract cheating around the blackmail. So those two articles were published a year apart, less than a year apart, opposite ends of the world. And through conversations with both Azelle and John Curtin, we were able to see that neither one of them knew that what the other was publishing. Um, and John York and his colleagues published in a scholarly journal. Alan Ezell, as a law enforcement professional, doesn't read those. Um, so really, these, these two parties didn't know what the others were doing. So our team was able to start connecting the dots and saying, law enforcement's doing one thing, scholars are doing another thing, opposite sides of the world. Now we need to start having the conversation as a community. And what does this mean? This is the highlight from our book. We brought it all together in our introductory chapter. We've got different chapters in the book on contract cheating, fraud in American varsity sports. Some of you might have heard about the um, Operation Varsity Blues scandal that happened some years ago uh, with parents and others taking part in admissions fraud in the US. So to synthesize our whole book, don't buy it, you've got the overview here. We were able to make concrete connections between degree mills, and the term degree mill and diploma mill are kind of contested. Um, who, who does what and who sells what? We're not talking here about low quality colleges or for-profit private colleges. We're talking about the organizations that sell you a degree. And if you happen to be on certain social media platforms, like Pinterest, for example, which is where I started to poke around and find these things, you can go on Pinterest, put in fake degree, you can get to a site where you can order a fake degree from not only a particular country, but a particular university in a particular field from a particular year, fully customized and sent to you, mailed to you within a couple of days. And the cost for those started at about $300 US. Alan Ezell focuses mainly on a company out of Pakistan called Axact, and he estimates that that um, organization is worth tens of billions of US dollars. That's billions, be like Bravo. Um, and that they also operate in a variety of different kinds of fraudulent documents, reference letters, transcripts, et cetera, also driver's licenses, passports, and a variety of different kinds of identity fraud. So the degree mills that are out there um, are operating at a global scale uh, with the US and countries in the Middle East being their largest customers. Not to say that you would be exempt here in Ireland, but to say that this is a global industry and the players are operating mostly online. It's very sophisticated, as sophisticated as some of the contract cheating industries. And it was through Alan Ezell that we were able to make the connection between degree mills and contract cheating because he had mentioned in another one of his articles that these companies, they're out there to make money. They've got a variety of product lines, as any big companies do. They also would provide things like, he called them reference services to help you write your essay paper. And I said to Alan Ezell, I said, you know, that's what we would call contract cheating. And he said to me, ma'am, I don't know what contract cheating is, but I know what organized crime is, and this is it. And he, again, connecting the dots for us. So the same companies will continue to provide things like exam proxy services, student course proxy services, uh, and in some case, uh, we're starting to extend this now to international recruitment. Um, I'll go to the bottom corner now and talk about admissions fraud, because again, uh, the same companies that might sell you fake degrees, fake transcripts, 
send in a fake student to write the exams for you. Um, we'll also provide testing proxies um, or fraud services before students ever get to our campuses. So for example, the services where they might hire someone to go in and write an English language proficiency exam for you on your behalf. Two of our chapters in our book were written by individuals who had previous roles with some of the largest English language proficiency providers in the world. They had had to sign non-disclosure agreements, so they were not allowed at any point in their lives to talk about specifics uh, or under the possible threat of legal action. But they told us that fraud is rampant in English language proficiency testing all over the world. And a couple of their chapters sort of highlight key high-level things because they weren't allowed to talk about specifics. So uh, leading into this as well would be the corrupt educational agents, of course, that work overseas to recruit our students uh, and then would help them by providing the services around English language proficiency testing, standardized achievement testing, fraudulent or tampered diplomas, transcripts, and so on. A more tenuous link that we're starting to make the connection to now, but it hasn't been as clear, is scholarly paper mills. So folks who work in publication ethics and research integrity will be most interested in this, that this, these industries are very likely connected to the contract cheating industries. So if someone is engaging with these companies when they are a student, that type of fraudulent behavior is possibly likely to continue once they become academics. So the idea is to start nipping this in the bud early in the process before it becomes a normalized behavior for students. Of course, not all of our students engage in this kind of behavior, but we have now been able to clearly connect the dots and show that a term paper mill is not just a term paper mill. There are boutique outfits that only offer specialized services. There are some mom and pop shops, as we would call them, that will sell you a fake degree on the side, but there are also global industries that will engage in what we will call in Canada, the full meal deal or the full service model, providing fraudulent services across the board. So this we've called the ecosystem of commercial academic fraud. Um, and we also wanted to look at the impact of credentialism and how is this all connected to the higher education system. We wanted to know about the correlation between credentialism and credential fraud. Cree Johnson's a legal professor in the United States and she said that credentialism happens when the employer pretends to need a degree and the employee pretends to have one. I'm not sure what it's like in Ireland, but in Canada in a very prominent, star, uh, I was gonna say the name of the place, a, a coffee chain um, that you might know of where you can get grand cups of coffee, you need a degree to work there. Why you need a degree to make coffee is beyond me but it really speaks to Johnson's idea around credentialism of the employer pretending to need a degree to make a cup of coffee. And then of course, if you don't have a job, but you need a degree, you order one from Pinterest, uh, and then you can go get a job in a coffee shop. And then she goes on to talk about, uh, along with another colleague who also worked out of the United States 40 years ago, master's degree being required for certain administrative jobs and teachers wanting to advance to the level of school superintendent needing a doctorate. And I work in a school of education now, and I can tell you that we have our Masters of Education and our Education Doctorate programs, and indeed, not only to be a school superintendent, which would have been the case back when Arnstein was talking in the 1980s, but now you need a Masters to be a vice principal of a school. And if you want to be a school principal, God help you if you don't have a doctorate. Uh, so the impact of credentialism continues to be pervasive. And here, Ernstein talks about the need of, uh, or the escalation of credentialism happening because uh, employees wanting to obtain degrees to elevate the perceived, uh, per perceived prestige of the organization for which they work for external and professional bodies because employees actually need the credential. Don't, they don't need it to do their job. And so this continues to be pervasive. Looking at the citations here, the parenthetical citations, and how long ago they were. 40 years ago we were talking about this, and now we're just starting to connect the dots. So, uh, given that we've got limited time today, I wanted to share with you some key highlights from the book. We know organized global industry, organized crime, as told to us by an FBI special agent who's now retired. We know that there's some indie operators, freelance operators, small, small mom and pop shops, but more pervasive, more concerning are the full service organizations that operate across borders, mostly online. 
And Alan Ezel has told us that this industry, including contract cheating that we've been able to put together and the fake and fraudulent degree, 21 billion US dollars and probably much more. So he would send us, Alan Ezel would send us financial documents from key informants, for example, who worked for Axe Act uh, internally in the company uh, and would send him the information. We were not allowed to publish it because those who provided that information were at risk of physical harm, uh, but showed us the financial statements corroborating that this was indeed the case. These companies are worth millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. This is not a small industry. Uh, and as I mentioned, the largest markets being in the US and Middle East, but we're certainly not exempt in Canada and I would contend that neither are you exempt in, in Ireland as well. Uh, so this is the scale at which we're dealing with these organizations and they're connected. Fake degrees relate to contract cheating, relate to uh, paper mills very likely in the scholarly and scientific publishing area. What, in terms of what we learned out of Canada, in Canada we are incredibly lax with regards to verifying the credentials of our applicants to uh, our positions. We ran a quick survey with registrars. We only got about 100 respondents, so we've considered it a pilot. We know that the results cannot be generalizable. They are nevertheless instructive. Only 45% of registrars and registrarial staff, so assistant registrars, associate registrars, felt uh, confident in their ability to detect faked credentials of applicants to academic programs, less than half. 87% reported that their institutions do not use an evaluation service to verify applicant documentation, either for domestic or international students. Uh, and 88% of reported cases of degree fraud or fake credentials among applicants or active student body. So the parenthetical note here is important because sometimes the fraud was not detected until after the student had been admitted and was actively enrolled. What that meant to us and what we figured out from some of the open-ended responses to our survey was, here's an example. Let's say, for example, I try to make it through a science degree and for whatever reason, I can't complete it. Um, I might get through third year, halfway through fourth year, and then I might be kicked out, I might withdraw, I might just not make it. The, t the process then is that I buy the degree online, the same degree I've been working towards, and I just couldn't make it across the finish line to earn it. And then I use that fake degree to then apply for graduate school. And if someone had said to me, oh, did you take Professor so-and-so's class in chemistry? Oh, yeah, because maybe you did. Or maybe you heard about your friends who had taken that later in the program. They might have the socialized knowledge in some cases to un understand and be able to answer questions, but be able to identify the fraud when people, uh, students are in the program. This was 88% of reported cases of degree fraud. So we were missing things at the time of application and not catching it then. We know in Canada and from conversations here with uh, folks in Ireland and then with colleagues in Australia that the impact of unethical educational recruitment agents is a big problem. If you are a researcher or a student looking for a research area in this field, I'm telling you this is it. Um, because it's completely understudied around the ways in which educational agents might exploit students. In fact, there was just a news story that I tweeted out from Canada the other day about students who were went to a university, they had an acceptance letter from a university, international students, the educational agents they'd worked with said, here, here's your acceptance letter into the University of Moncton in New Brunswick on the east coast of Canada. The student showed up and the university said, who are you? We don't have any record of you. Uh, the students had received a fake acceptance letter from the educational agents. In that case, the students ended up being determined that they were qualified and were allowed to take part, but the fraud goes both ways, both for the customer, uh, the student in this case, uh, and the universities can be defrauded. Um, and it's changing students' institutions, so educational institutions in our case, or agents promising a prestigious university, and then funneling students into a private career college, possibly owned by the cousin, of the illegitimate educational recruitment agents. In some cases, students are uh, forced to surrender their passports to the educational agents because they need to work. They need to be able to pay their rent, often living six, eight, ten to a one-bedroom apartment. They can't afford food, they can't afford rent. The agent says, oh, I can get you a job, just need to take your passport for the application, and then they never get it back. And in some cases, people coming into the country wanting to be students and being directed to a variety of different jobs, including jobs in the sex trade. 
So all of this is a completely understudied area. We, are, we know that it's happening, but we don't have the evidence in the same way a few years ago, we didn't have the evidence about fake degrees. This is something that requires more attention. Here's one from EduCanada. EduCanada is an extension or an arm of the Canadian government. Uh, it's a, just a screenshot of their website, and I won't go into the details, but maybe you can see the headline at the top that says, Beware of Fraud when Preparing to Come to Canada. This website is directed to prospective international students. So our government is now alerting people who want to come to our country to study that they may be the victims of fraud. This would be one thing I think that governments and quality assurance agencies could do in any country where educational fraud and illegitimate agents are a problem. Possibly it could be something done here in Ireland and Australia as well, because f to some extent, the students might be naive, thinking, oh, I'm going to go to a new place and have a new life, and then they get there, and that's not at all the case. Quickly touch on the Handbook of Academic Integrity. Uh, it's coming out now. The first edition was done by Tracy Bretag in 2016. This is a major reference work, meaning it's a one-stop shop for people and readers to get the newest information about the field of academic integrity. In fact, Kane has a co-authored chapter in it uh, and others. He's one of 112. 109 are new. We carried forward a couple from the, from the previous edition. In reference, meaning the digital version, is available online. So I'll pull together some of the key ideas from the handbook so that you've got them at the top of your brain before we wrap up. The handbook with 112 chapters, you might imagine, it's a massive effort. We've divided the handbook into 11 sections. We've got a different editor, a section editor for each section. You can see that we cover everything from global perspectives to ethical teaching and assessment as being part of the puzzle, supporting students with academic integrity and ethical learning, student breaches, in other words, how to deal with misconduct, this is Kane's area of expertise, contract cheating and commodification of misconduct, that's where some of the fake degrees would come in, contract cheating, term paper mills, Connecting academic integrity and quality assurance. This is something that I believe you do really well in Ireland. And in fact, there's a chapter from folks in QQI in that section as well. A new section in our handbook, looking at equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, and its relationship to assessment and academic integrity. Overrepresentation, for example, in reporting of students from specific demographic groups, something that until the handbook hasn't really been investigated. Connecting the dots between ethics in uh, academia and research and publishing as well. Another section on the ro uh, role of technology in cybersecurity. And this is where we've got chapters on artificial intelligence. Number 10 is for the graduate students and the early career researchers. Uh, academic integrity is a field of scholarship. How to do it, what methods to use, etc. And for folks like me, when I started my career and being turned down for internal grants because academic integrity, I was told, is an administrative area not a research topic, and that when I grow up, I would get a real research area, like assessment or STEM. Someone said, you can't have a career researching academic integrity. I'm like, I said, watch me. And now, wanting to set the stage for other scholars who want to do this as a field of study and have a career in this. And then finally, looking at academic integrity, leadership at national and international levels, exploring the role of organizations such as the European Network for Academic Integrity, and, and how do they play out and support people in different countries and across borders. So this is a brief overview. And as the editor-in-chief of this work, oops, I'll go back one, there we go. As I was reading all the chapters, I wanted to draw a through line. Uh, what was the common denominator? And at first it seemed like these were a set of disconnected chapters simply between two covers, but it wasn't the case. When I looked at all of the chapters and what bound them together, looking at the what came through was a model of comprehensive academic integrity. Certainly in North America, we are obsessed with academic integrity as only a matter of student conduct. And it's true that that remains important, but academic integrity must extend beyond student conduct. Most of our students now, even if they're undergraduates, might be encouraged to include and get engaged in research and publication. Some places you need to publish in order to earn a doctorate. So publication ethics, research ethics and integrity are more and more part of student life, even at the undergraduate level. Looking at instructional ethics, ethical assessment in our university and other universities in North America, I'm sure it doesn't happen here, we have professors that recycle assessments, I'm, right? And students come and say to us, if professors can recycle their assessments, why can't we recycle the answers? 
why can't we post them on file sharing sites? So looking at what does ethical assessment mean, particularly in the age of artificial intelligence, we won't have time to delve into that today, um, but certainly looking at the ethics of this because students will look to us to model the behavior. And that leads into ethical leadership and institutional ethics with the undercurrent there being, we can't expect students to act with integrity if the institutions in which they're learning are corrupt. I'm not suggesting your institution or mine are corrupt, but you can imagine with 112 chapters from all over the world that we've got com uh, countries that range pretty high on the corruption, the global corruption index, uh, and recognizing the ways in which corruption and fraud are part of this. And all of this leading into a key message from the handbook, academic integrity as a foundation for ethical decision making in and beyond the classroom. Academic integrity as ethical decision making in and beyond the classroom as a foundation for everyday ethics. This is how we can make academic integrity make sense to our students. It's not about just not plagiarizing or not cheating on exams, but rather helping them understand that what they learn in school sets the stage for what they do uh, in their professional life and every day. And certainly when we look back to the ecosystem of fraud, we can say that if a fraudulent behavior becomes normalized, then it can be repeated past student days into professional days and literally become part of what Alan Ezel calls the long con the person who engages in fraudulent behavior year after year after year, and this is the place to curb this. And professional and collegial ethics, of course, treating each other with dignity uh, and respect. So this is our framework, comprehensive uh, framework for act integrity. This, this is what pulls the book together. I'll briefly mention Irene Glendinning's section because I think it's relevant here around academic integrity and quality assurance. This is a screenshot, far too small to see on your screen. But suffice to say that Irene's led a section really drives the quality of the credentials that we award at the end. We must consider academic integrity as part of the picture. Now that may seem like common sense to everyone here today, joining us in the room and online, um, but I can say that it's not that way everywhere in the world. This is part of the conversation that we need to put forward, that quality assurance is not just something we do at an institutional level, it comes right down to the decisions we make every day with our students. So here's Irene's uh, introductory chapter, linking quality standards and integrity. I've got a link there on the, on, on the screen. Uh, if you happen to want a copy of this chapter, um, just drop me a line and I can certainly share it with you. So I'll wrap up with a few recommendations and the time we have together, and that's that recognizing the problem of fake degrees and fraudulent credentials is real. And it's not just a one-off that you might hear about in the news every now and again, that the problem extends far beyond what the average professor knows about in their classroom. And as academic researchers, we must partner with people who are not academics to do this work. Whether it's higher education professionals, members of the government, nonprofit, or law enforcement, we need to start doing a better job of connecting the dots. And as academics, we can't just live in our own little silos anymore. It's not good enough for the work we need to do in this space. But um, it is the responsibility of institutions, not individuals, to take responsibility for developing admissions security protocol. As an individual, if the institution I work for doesn't have those processes and systems in place, um, and that academic integrity must include and extend beyond student conduct and be evident at every level of the organization for transparency and leadership, research integrity, codes of conduct for staff and leaders, and so on. But be firm, if I can leave you with one message, that academic integrity does not start uh, at the program level. It starts at the admission stage, not the enrollment stage or the study stage. If we don't start catching potential fraud before students start our programs, we're literally inviting them con to continue the fraud throughout their program. And I'll close there and look forward to questions. going to bring us back to the uh, poll which was opened uh, earlier. Uh, we've, we've had some interesting responses there. The question was, 
what should we do differently in the plagiarism, cheating, and misconduct space? And uh, the, the, the leading answer there was use alternative assessment methods that reduce opportunities for cheating. So maybe that's one strategy we might end up uh, talking about later on. But um, time's not our friend, so I, I won't dwell too much longer on these results right now. But I will introduce a second poll, if that's OK. So you take part in the second poll the same way as the first one. Go to slido.com, so people in the room can do this as well. Just go to a, a browser on your, on your computer or on your mobile phone. Go to slido.com, put in the code MTU Integrity, and uh, have a look at the question that we've just posted there. And after that poll closes, there'll be another window in which people can submit questions to be asked of the panel. In fact, at present, there's a number of questions have already been submitted, and people can vote on the questions that they'd like posed uh, to the panel. But uh, right now, I'm going to invite Violetta to take to the stage again and introduce our second speaker. <clears throat> thank you very much, Carol Wood, and thank you, Sarah, for that very interesting presentation. I did not need to take you to Villarney. You can, you can well speak <laughs> with or without the Villarney zone. But as you're talking there, I was thinking, uh, I was trying to think about the, even if you take one uh, company like Chegg, is seemingly something like 12 billion um, business, uh, 70,000 people employed, and for as little as 14.95 a month, you can get a subscription and put in your um, assessment one or um, question two or exam three and get, get it emailed to you in, in no time whatsoever. So um, that is a scary thought, and that's just one company. So um, our next our next speaker is Mark. <laughs> Macquarie University in Sydney. I know, I know, I know. So, um, Kane is the head of Complaints and Misconduct and Appeals Office, uh, and he's also an expert in um, detecting academic misconduct and contract cheating. In fact, Kane is so good at his job that in the last year alone, he got um, five death threats. Now, I teach mathematics, so I don't necessarily have the love of all the students after an exam. But coming, coming to work knowing that there's a pride is, is quite something. You know, it isn't, you know, it's quite something to come into your work, place of work, thinking that there is somebody that is trying to kill me. So um, that must be quite stressful. So um, from, as you can see from his title, um, Kane deals with uh, misconduct of all sorts, uh, sexual misconduct, any kind of misconduct. But today, uh, Kane will focus on um, academic misconduct and um, academic integrity and detection of... Uh, contract cheating. Thank you, Kane. Thanks for your letter. Um, among the things that, um, the labels that might be applied to me that I can share in polite company, the one that I think I prefer the most is that someone called me a disruptor. And they said it approvingly. And I think that while Sarah mentioned there's this focus on student conduct as the be-all and end-all of academic integrity. I think I've, while taking a different avenue to Sarah, very much share her views around that it's not just about punishing students, it's not just about catching and cheating. It actually has a lot of implications for academia, for academics, for institutions. And I wanted to kind of broaden out that conversation beyond Turnitin, for example. Um, so as Violetta mentioned, my, I run an office that handles all misconduct across my unit, my university, and my background is in, I've been detecting contract cheating and investigating it for about seven years or so, and when it's someone's job, you tend to be better and better at it. It's not something you do on the side of your desk. You can focus on it. You can think about it and you tend to get better at it. Who would have thought? Um, but what it's dawned on me over the years is that cheating has changed. We think about cheating like this. You know, we think about a student walking into an exam with notes on their hand or the phone. We think about it as a transactional, incidental type of thing. And it's like an error or a mistake, which I actually agree that in that kind of scenario, I still refer to things as mistakes rather than a, someone suffered a catastrophic moral collapse. But what we think of as cheating 
is so so much broader and Sarah kind of touched on it there and I'd like to expand on it further. So, but to do that, we actually have to start thinking about cheating as a concept a bit differently. We think about catching it and punishing it. It's kind of like catch and release with fish. And I prefer not to think of students as fish. I think about them as people and I think about them as complex people. Like we have a, a, sometimes a tendency to think about students in a very simplistic way. Students, you know, go into an exam, there are no good nick, they cheated, and we feel quite justified in punishing them. But I tend to think about it as students come in with multiple motives into academia. They come in, some come in hyper um, motivated to learn, some of them come in for credentials, a lot of students come in because society and their parents and schools have kind of taught them that this is the avenue that you should go. Some come in to gain just an idea of success about themselves. There was lots of different students. This should have been perfectly obvious to everyone, so we needed a multi-pronged approach. But the way that I think about my work is not catching students, it's to create an environment in which their learning is central but also I'm creating pressure to act with integrity. So in other words, changing a kind of risk reward ratio. And students have told me over and over again that when they have to think about cheating and they think about the likelihood of being caught versus the rewards they might gain, it does change the way they think about it. The other one I want to think about and talk about here is when we think about risk, students obviously understand that risk, but also institutions have not thought about the risks that are truly involved with allowing cheating to flourish. We've kind of considered that the certain steps we take are more than enough and it, it covers it. We have an online module and if students don't obey the rules, then we punish them and then we can publish numbers and say we've got the problem under control. Now, what I'm going to show you is that we probably don't have it under control, almost certainly don't, and we certainly do not understand the risks institutionally that we bring upon ourselves when we fail to apply downward pressure. So another frame for this is I don't think about catching students cheating as such. I'm not particularly interested in the moral aspects. I would like students to act ethically, but I'm not a godhead and I don't really believe that one incidence of doing something will radically change someone's life. You can kind of shift them over time. But I tend to focus on learning and where learning has occurred and where it hasn't occurred. And when students cheat, obviously, they fail to demonstrate their learning and that's the most important thing to me. And I find it instructive when I think about what the outcomes of processes should be. Do I feel the need to overpunish? I think a lot of the times in, say, plagiarism matters, people can kind of investigate it, decide it, and consider that it was a grievous breach of academic standards. Now, when I think about plagiarism, I think that is way down the bottom of the spectrum because I've seen way at the top of the spectrum. Um, so it kind of changes your view about what is an appropriate outcome and you want it to be equitable as well. So when I focus on learning, I don't really have to worry about whether that was fair because I'm m maintaining more of my focus on what the learning, what learning was demonstrated or not. So when we think about learning analytics, we analyse um, VLEs, we analyse activity, and we think about how students learn. When I analyse VLE activity, I'm looking for evidence that a student has failed to learn. And I'm not looking at it through content as such. I'm non-academic, I'm a professional member of staff. But the, all these things are observable in metadata. And universities create multitudes of metadata. And we've done a very poor job of analysing it or even identifying it as a source of information. So when I'm looking at logs, I'm actually looking for absence of the student the student's voice as such in their activity is not present and that leads to insights about student behaviour. So, as I said, when we think about kind of 
plagiarism. We basically think that's under control, and I generally would agree. There's crit critiques of turn it in as a thing, but it did change the way students thought about doing that. It did introduce an element of risk, and students obviously can take steps to try to avoid that, but nonetheless, it changed the way they think about it. Sometimes it makes it easier to do the work than copy. And so you end up with more like incidental plagiarism, a student who managed their time poorly, a student who was working too much, a student who failed to attend a lecture and was catching up in some way. And so turn it in kind of for all its faults, it does kind of address that. But what turn it in really is, is a 2005 technology. So it shows up similarity to other things, but it really hasn't advanced us any further than that from 2005. So it's a perfectly fine response to that. But then we go to paper mills and Turnitin does not address that in any way, shape or form. And paper mills, someone sends off a question, they put in a credit card or a PayPal and they get a file back and people were left in this kind of new paradigm of not having any, any insight into how, go, how to go about detecting it effectively. And we're still there to some extent. That, that bin is still on fire, which I'll show you in a moment. But we didn't ever really address that. And that term was coined in 2006. It's now 2023. And now we have AI. And that's a different problem. But this has been the approach. It's like academic looks at a piece of paper. I don't know what you can see in that block of text. But I don't see anything that indicates cheating. And that's literally how we've expected academics to deal with this problem. So why can't you tell that there's cheating? It's because it's a block of text and it doesn't tell you very much. It doesn't tell you much about authorship unless you can include other information. So other corroborating information. And that's where we come to metadata. So I'll give you a brief explanation of this. Each of the coloured cells is a different student. You can see the timelines on the left. You can see what activities they're doing in the middle. There's mostly submitting Turnitin assignments. And you can see all those assignments are being submitted from the same IP address. So when we see that, that tells us quite a bit about whether those individual students were submitting that work and whether they were responsible for that work, whether they owned it. And what we've done over a number of years is go from those first principles to start thinking about how do you go about scaling that up and reducing the risks to the institution that this kind of thing is happening. And obviously, when this is happening, a commercial provider has students log in credentials to your VLE. Students are also incurring massive personal risks, identity theft, blackmail, which Sarah mentioned, there's huge amounts of risk being created, but when it, this is invisible to the institution, that risk is totally unmanaged. And the end result is that we have students who quite possibly graduate without the knowledge and skills we expect them to have. So when we started to think about this, it's not just an individual student trying to solve an individual assessment problem. It's actually a networked activity. And by that, I mean, there's a number of ways to think about that. So it's connected through the internet. There's more often than not multiple students involved. So where a contractor has solved the problem in a, in a subject for one student, there's a lot of reasons for them to go and find more students to solve the problem for, because all of a sudden they've got economies of scale. Students start to understand that other students are doing it. And that brings in more students because they, again, didn't see any risk. The rewards are quite high. And in effect, you have a growing problem totally unchecked. But what we're looking for in this data is patterns, predictable, repeatable patterns. We're not using machine learning or artificial intelligence. We're literally seeing things that we've worked out manually and then we start to think about, okay, we have 45,000 students at Macquarie, 
There's bigger universities in Australia. One university is almost double that size. And it's literally impossible for a human or even a team of humans to look at that much data. So you just start to think about how do we go about bringing in that data? How, we, how do we go about searching it and making it effective? So what we're also looking for is departures from patterns. As you yourselves know, you tend to have certain habits. They might change from now and then. You know, for example, I would typically be logged in from Australia in Sydney, but at the moment, everyone would see me logged in from Cork, from Ireland, and that is a departure from my typical pattern, but it's explicable as well. So I can show that I had plane tickets, I can show that I was invited here, and it makes sense. Where, when we typically ask students to explain radical departures from patterns, they are not able to provide evidence of that. And sometimes those departures, are, it's literally impossible that it could have been the student. So what you start to find when you start to work this up manually is that there's hurdles and they become hurdles of scale, hurdles of resources, hurdles of technical skill. Um, for example, my first hurdle in this space was getting access to data out of our VLE. And then you cross that hurdle and then you need admin level access to the VLE and so on and so on. My technical skills, I'm not too bad, but I can't program. And so I hired a bioinformatician to do programming. Um, these hurdles, you start to, as you go further and further into the work, you start to realise how big the hurdles are. But I think we've crossed most of them. So scalability is one. If you think about any academics in the room who've ever dealt with a misconduct matter of any sort, there's kind of usually fairly detailed processes about how to go about managing that. And they can be quite laborious. They can involve a meeting with a student. They can involve sending it off to another decision maker. You start to think about these things in the light of what you're seeing. And when I say that students are getting a subject completed for them, once they do it once, it's kind of like Pringles, the crappy American chips. Once you have one, you don't stop at one. And that's been my experience because the rewards are still there and the risks are still low. In other words, you've had, had it confirmed once you, nothing happened once after you did it, you've kind of got a bit of confirmation bias that it's going to be fine. And so scalability becomes an issue because what we've seen is that students will have multiple subjects completed on their behalf and they will tend to dabble in other areas as well. So they might be more likely to engage in collusion even if they're not involved in contract cheating because, again, the risks are low and the rewards are high. So being able to access data, being able to have relatively um, smooth processes that don't, in, that don't involve a huge amount of different steps is really quite important when you're thinking about academic integrity policies. So the way we addressed our particular problem, because I can't imagine that Ireland is significantly different to Australia, you know, we're all English speaking, we're relatively wealthy, we have a lot of the same attractors and a lot of the same reasons that students go to uni in the first place in our countries. But we started to see more and more of this. And so, as I said, I hired um, a bioinformatician. His name is Sean Lehman. Um, as it turns out, he's a Indigenous Noongar man from the southwest of Western Australia. And the Noongar word for owl is wiru. And the program that he wrote is called Waroo. And what it does, in effect, gives us a range of different information at cohort level. So whole subjects were able to review really quickly. Because typically, if you had to start from one student, it'd burn your time enormously. So when we see this, what we see here, the dots are students, and the connections between them are shared IP addresses. And so when I see this, this gives me no reason for concern. So this could be a whole series of students all sharing a flat, going to the library, the connections aren't very thick, 
When they're thick, that means there's lots of shared IP addresses, but these are relatively incidental kind of encounters here in our VLE. But when you see this, this actually gives you a completely different picture about the types of activities that are occurring in your VLE. So the, as I said, the thick lines are multiple shared IP addresses and the thickness of the cluster means that more students are sharing more of those IP addresses. And when you think about normal behaviour or even you know, vaguely predictable behaviour, that's not very normal as such. As I said, people tend to have habits. They tend to work from uni, they tend to work from home. There will be occasions when they go and hang out with their friends and study. That's all perfectly normal. But having connections to 50 or 60 or 70 other students across many different networks, many different unique IP addresses, these things tend to throw up other questions. So we can get a very quick visual guide to whether we think we have a problem in a unit. And we can start approaching it from a risk-based approach rather than a reactive approach. When I receive something from an academic, I'm reacting to their concerns where I can take a systematic approach. Which of our degrees do we consider the most crucial to our well-being, to our reputation? For example, professional degrees we might consider are more concerning to the public, to regulators, to government, and so we can start looking at those units first and then make our way systematically through the entire offerings of the university. As I said, they come in lots of different forms, but you can instantly see the difference between unconcerning behaviour and really concerning behaviour. And I haven't even made this as scary as it could be. When you start to pull out these students and you can see how many students they're connected to, it's not impossible, but it's highly improbable that you would have that many connections to that many students repeated throughout the whole cluster. So we're able to make a cohort-based risk approach. And so one of the outputs of WIRU work diagram, another output is a cohort risk score. So in other words, we're able to look for certain behaviours to see how often they occur, and identify students within that cohort, or even the percentage of students in that cohort that we consider problematic. If there's two students, that's different to when there's 42 students. And so we're able to kind of prioritise our work and prioritise the think about it. So for example, when we can see that there's significant risk in a cohort, i.e. significant risk in a subject, we can start looking at the assessment in that subject to see whether that's contributing to the issue. And we've quite often found that that's the case. For example, uninvigilated online exams, they are a risky approach. And so we can start to contribute to assessment design rather than just punishing students. Among the things we're looking for, and we look for more than this, but when we can see multiple countries accessing student's account in our VLE, and there can be perf for that, by the way. A student is on holiday at the start, they come back to the country and complete the semester. That's perfectly acceptable. And we can look at that pretty quickly. But use of lots of different VPN addresses, again, people tend to be a bit predictable. You don't do random things for random reasons randomly all the time. You tend to just have preferences. We also see significant differences between non-assessment activity and assessment activity. And what we'll see is VPNs being used to complete assessments in the hope that that obscures the identity of the user on the other end. But again, it's statistically analysable. And what we've also seen is impossible travel. So by that I mean, if you have two clicks close by in time in the VLE, one from Australia and one from Ireland, there is can fly you around the world, so there's no way you could actually explain that logically. And beyond that, the third output, once we start identifying students at risk, we can start doing deep dives into their entire VLE activity. We also combine this with Turnitin authorship data, i.e. just simple metadata from their submitted documents. And what we'll find is that when they're getting assessments produced by a third party, 
they're not necessarily changing the name back to Kane Murdoch. And so you'll see a range of different or a range of different software being used and a range of other indicators from that. So we're able to provide corroborating information and not just, I hope this is enough to get us over the line. And we can do that for any given student in about five minutes. And so it really means that our resources on my team, I have five people in my team, but there's plenty of unis who have zero people in a team. They have no, no team. And so you can start thinking, about how to use that team's resources effectively to manage risk rather than simple punishment. So as I said, to come back, we're actually looking for non-learning behaviour. So we're trying to identify where is the student's presence in their own account, in the activity on their own account, and where there is a third party, i.e. the student has not. That's the kind of I find most helpful, helpful in terms of the work. I also find a correct outcome be, because as I said, unis have a tendency to punish and I think it's self-defeating. But students kind of feel it's a bit unfair, but we feel justified because they cheated and I understand that impulse. But I think we can have students understanding more of why what they did was wrong when we focus on their learning rather than simply punishing. Um, I run a, my process is called Courageous Conversations and basically it invites the student to be honest with us. It gives them a small incentive. So if they've cheated on one essay, they lose the marks for that essay. But it, if they're honest, it doesn't extend beyond on that. So it incentivizes them to a certain extent, but it still retains the focus. If you didn't learn, you can't get any credit for that learning. And I find those twin kind of avenues to be pretty helpful on the whole. As I said, you get a bigger picture when you bring in more data. So we combine the log data and 20 subjects worth of data rather than looking at a single assignment submission or one subject. And we combine that with Turnitin metadata. And again, you get a much better impression about what the habits of someone are, where they typically log in from, what machine they might use to write their papers. And you can kind of see this over time rather than looking for a specific instant of something. You get a much bigger, wider picture. If I refer back to that text, that gives you almost no visibility of the provenance of that work. And where our view is that we can see whether a student was engaged, wasn't engaged, whether that assignment submission was a departure from their typical patterns, and it gives us a lot stronger insights. And the last part, and again, this was another hurdle. When you have people who typically don't know, don't have a very deep understanding of contract cheating, and people struggle to quantify it, people struggle to analyse that much data, and it becomes that becomes a, a next hurdle. And so what we've done is actually made it so Wiru actually produces a objective fact-based report. It describes the behaviours that we're seeing and allows us to edit it as appropriate if we look at the and decide we're not concerned concerned with that, we can remove it without problem. And it's a major, major step forward for us because most unis do not have significant investigative capacities. Most unis use academics who do, simply do not have the time. And even if they did, would be incentivized otherwise. So if you're having to make the choice between marketing, research and investigating a student for 20 subjects of conduct, I'm pretty sure I know which way most ac academics would prefer to go. And this crosses a line in terms of efficiency and objectivity. <coughs> point that often will betrayal. And so I think bringing objectivity into these processes is crucial because we tend to go down 
wrong avenues or at least inequitable avenues when we're unable to maintain objectivity. We have views about what is appropriate and what is not. And I think when we can pass that into a more objective, thanks, um, a more objective process, we can certainly make it fairer for students, more effective at managing risk and generally cheaper, which is not, you know, it's not something we shouldn't be concerned about. So I know that there is a certain thing around, you know, we can chase the rabbit all the way down the hole. Um, I tend to th take the view that at the moment we have a bin fire and it's out of control and we need to take, take some steps to fix that. We tend to think that assessment design will radically fix all our problems. In my view, it won't. We actually need program redesign and assessment redesign to follow in train. But there's short, though, anything that can reduce the cost of the short-term issues while raising the level of um, integrity and reducing our risk is probably something worth doing. But I certainly think that unis should be looking very seriously at their programs. Anything reliant on individual academics is its own risk. And so I think institutions need to take the risks very seriously, especially in the light of generative AI, which is a game changer. So I'll stop there and thanks very much. Okay, so we had a second poll there. What do you believe is the biggest current threat to academic